WNSB, Norfolk, Chesapeake, 91.1 FM, and HD1. The number one station. Number one station. Virginia's only full-time urban alternative station. Blaze and Hot 91. Hi, it's Dr. Eric Laville, award-winning host of State of the Water, where we bring policymakers, movers, and shakers to you to discuss real issues and current events impacting African Americans. Tune in every Sunday at 1 o'clock here on WNSB Blazing Hot 91. State of the Water is engaging, educational, informative, and impactful. An initiative of the Center for African American Public Policy at Norfolk State University. After a stagnation and in some places a decline in COVID-19 infections and deaths, it seems that a rise is, is inevitable going into the holiday and flu months. Governors, including Governor Northam, right here in Virginia, have implemented tighter restrictions. And some say this will cause our fragile economy to go back into a double dip recession. But what's more important, saving lives or saving jobs? It's the pandemic and the economy. And this is State of the Water. And I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Laville. And we want to hear from you as we discuss and inform the public about these and other important issues. When we'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back, and this is State of the Water, and I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Claville. We want to thank all of you for tuning in with us on this Sunday after Thanksgiving. You know, we want to, we hope that everybody's Thanksgiving, even though it was a different Thanksgiving, given the pandemic, was truly blessed, it was joyous, joyful, and you ate a lot. You know, but of course we're dealing with, I mentioned that this is a different type of Thanksgiving because we're dealing with... COVID-19 and the pandemic, but I also want us to understand that this is a time to be thankful. So we want to know, what are you thankful for? As we discuss the pandemic and the economy, still we got lots to be thankful for. So give us a call, 757-823-9110, 757-823-9110. You know, but I want to jump right into COVID-19 and was called the pandemic. You know, this is something that at the beginning of the year, and I can, you know, when I think about this year, how fast it it has gone by. It seems just like yesterday, you know, we were dealing with the news of a virus coming over across across the Pacific to us from, from Asia, from China more specifically, coming into the United States. And we didn't know whether, you know, to believe it or not because we had mixed messages coming from the White House, You know, and then, of course, it comes out that they were trying to cover it up and saying that, oh, don't worry about it it'll go away because the president was worried about his reelection bid. And then all of a sudden we get these really big warning signs. Individuals are getting sick. They're coming to the hospital. We don't know what it is. It's something that's novel. And then we get Dr. Fauci who comes on and says, listen, this is something serious. We need to pay attention to it. But. At that point, we understand that it's airborne. So immediately, the economy shut down. Now, I don't know where you were when we were told we're shutting things down. You can't go into restaurants. Um, If you're going to go outside, you got to wear a mask. But all these things seem like something out of a movie, right? I mean, a lot of people were watching various movies like Outbreak and uh, other movies that, that dealt with pandemics and diseases that were airborne because it seemed like something that Hollywood wrote. But we quickly found out that this was something real. You know, right now we stand at over 13 million total infections. And this is with there were some of the restrictions in place and we have people who are adhering to the restrictions and not. We're going to talk about that. I want us to really delve into what we're dealing with because some people were saying, hey, the mayor out of Detroit saying, you just wear your mask, everything will be all right. And others are saying, hey, if we just wait on this vaccine, everything will be okay. But we are learning more and more that we have to take more precautions and be careful in things that we do. So I mentioned over 13 million infections and unfortunately, over a quarter million deaths. 
due to COVID-19. In some places, as a matter of fact, in places like El Paso, Texas, where there's only 700,000 people, they have more people who are in the hospital for COVID-19 than in 19 states plus the District of Columbia. That is astonishing. And it should send off some red flags. You know, so as we start to deal with this, now governors are starting to implement some tighter restrictions. As a matter of fact, uh, one restriction was just challenging the U.S. Supreme Court as it relates to churches. Governor Cuomo out of New York put restrictions on certain churches in certain what they call colored uh, zones. If you're in orange or if you're in red, that designates whether you're in a high risk area or a lower risk area. And how many people can attend these services in these various zones? And the Supreme Court, of course, with the conservative uh, slant that we currently have, ruled 5-4 that this went against the Constitution and freedom of religion and assembly and your First Amendment rights, basically. So churches were able to say we're going to have more people in. But, of course, here in Virginia, our governor also implemented some tighter restrictions as well. Uh, November 13th, that went into effect November 15th, right before Thanksgiving. Individuals are not able to gather in 250, any, uh, 250 limits anymore, but now it's down, back down to 25. Now, there are some exceptions in there. Churches are, are there's an exception for churches, but you have to adhere to these, these very onerous uh, cleaning uh, standards, seating, uh, uh, spacing and mass inside and, and the like that it almost makes it, you know, not even worth it to have more than 25 people in there, depending on how large your sanctuary is. But, you know, some people are saying this is too much, that we're not, you know, that we should have freedom. This is America. This is freedom. But at what point does your, do your freedoms underscore other individuals' right to live, including your own? You know, are your rights more important or being able to live more important? We want to hear from you. 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. What are your thoughts about the increase in COVID infection rates and deaths? What about the restrictions that are being put on here, not just in Hampton Roads and Virginia, but across the country? Do we need more? Do we need less? Do you think that our elected officials, including our president, have done a good job with this? Because this is the number one issue that President-elect Biden is going to deal with coming into office. 757-823-9110. Also, how has COVID-19 affected you personally? What is your story? How has it affected you and your job and your family? We want to hear from you. 757-823-9110. But I want to get back to you know, what these restrictions are. Some, the, the governor of Detroit, I mean, the mayor of Detroit said, if you just wear a mask, we won't have to shut down businesses anymore. Now, to me, that seems like a very easy uh, thing to do. You know, wearing a mask now is just like, all right, I got my glasses, I got my keys to the car, I got my wallet, I got my ID, I got my mask, I'm out of the house, right? Being smart, going to places, uh, that I need to go to, still operating in society, you know, still, you know, working out the, the whole nine, right? But being safe about it. And thank God for it. You know, none of our family's been affected, you know, by it. But we still have to be vigilant because we're coming into the flu months, right? You know, so are these restrictions to help us or to harm us? Are they to go against your freedoms? You know, I'm of the belief that is there to help you. You know, but again, we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts? You know, you got people who are, you know, basically organizing rallies, individuals who are defying, you know, the the law of the land, saying that we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that because this is our freedom. But at the same time, you know, we have to also be our brother's keeper. So if I know that I'm sick, it's very irresponsible for me to go around my friends or go around other people who are uh, not in my immediate house, and infecting them. And I don't want to walk around with a scarlet letter to say I have, you know, this sickness. So I, the prudent thing to do is stay home, get well, do the things that your physician tells you to do, follow the science. 
So with that, we see during the Thanksgiving holiday that maybe a lot of people were not adhering to that. As a matter of fact, a lot of individuals were uh, flying, a lot of individuals were traveling, going back home. And we know that is very important to be around family. Extremely important to be around family during holidays because that's, you know, that's family. You, you can't replace that. You know, no matter what you do with your job, your career, you simply can't replace family. But, you know, one thing that we did in our family across several, several uh, states, we had what's called a Zoom Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, so everybody stayed at their own house. Everyone cooked their own food. And, and we, we did it over Zoom. You know, we, we laughed and we, we, we joked around as we always do. And we were with family and, and, and everybody cooked. We showed what everybody had. And, you know, we had prayer over the meal. And from there, we talked after. Everybody ate. Then we talked a little bit more. Everybody got back on. And, you know, again, just family time. Everybody was safe. Everybody was in their own home. And, and it worked, right? But there are a lot of things that we're living in a different time. So we're having to do things a little differently. But, you know, I, I said, listen, if we do it this way, you know, if we play our cards right and, and God blesses us, we'll make it to the next year. And hopefully by that time we could see each other in person again. But many people fought against that. They traveled home. They were going to go see their older relatives. They were going to go uh, and they are having these large get togethers. And now we're looking at whether these these rallies by the president were super spreader events. And we're calling some of these things super spreader because we don't know. You know, being in close proximity to individuals, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, 3,000, 4,000 people together, and then all of a sudden, you know, from there, you go home, and then you go into the workplace, you go into stores, you go to gas stations, and you go across the community. And who knows what you have? But we know that it's something that is high risk and something that as citizens and responsible citizens, maybe that we shouldn't do. But what are your thoughts? Do you believe in these tighter restrictions? Should we have a mass mandate across the country? You know, are these things that the new president-elect should be looking at? As a matter of fact, when we look at the top two things that we're looking at as, as it relates to president-elect coming into office, number one is the pandemic. He's going to have to deal with the pandemic and the economy. And we have to see if we could balance the two. You know, because a lot of people under, are saying that these these individual restrictions will cause them to lose their jobs, cause them to uh, uh, lose their business and the like. But what are your thoughts? We have a caller on the line. Caller, you're on Stay of the Water. Tell us your name and where you're calling for. Uh, it's Sylvia Boone. And just um, a, a small comment I wanted to make and just, you know, my thoughts on this. Yes, ma'am. Um, this virus, it, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. But also the effect that this virus has on people is a real thing. So my thought is to just do things in balance. Most people are going to do what they want to do anyway. So I say if you're going to do it, do it in balance. You mentioned, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of elderly people and, you know, 500 family members want to go see them. I just use common sense. You know, why won't two of people? Because people need human contact. They need the love of family. That's just what we are born to do to be around family. The Zoom calls are great. We did that. But sometimes you just need to put your eyes on or your hands on a loved one. So I said, if you're going to do it, and most people are, I mean, do it with caution. Do it with common sense. Instead of 20 people going, you know, get a close family member you with, knowing that they're well, knowing that they're following the precautions of this real virus, and two or three people get together. It's better than none people because depression is real. Hopelessness is real, yes. and sometimes when you don't have the hand or the care of a person in your life, on your life, those things can take you out sometimes quicker than the virus. Ms. Boone, so I say I, imbalance. Ms. Boone, I thank you so much for your call and your comments, and it's, it's well taken. Balance is the key to life. And I know we're dealing with, this is the pandemic and, economy sh and economic show, but we also have a lot to be thankful for. So can you tell us one thing that you're thankful for in 2020? Oh, the best thing, the most important thing to me that I'm thankful for is family. You know, I said this to um, 
uh, over our Zoom call. I'm just so grateful you are blessed with a family, and they don't have to be blood relatives, blessed with a family who just does not go away. You can't get away from them. You can do all the wrong. You can do all the pulling away. You can even do damage. But when you're blessed with a family who who treats you when needed to be like the prodigal, you can't get away from us. Yeah, you do damage, but we're still here. You pull away, but we're still here. Ms. So I'm just grateful for family. <laughs> Thank you so much for your call. Okay. Have a wonderful year. Well, you know, the caller was speaking about balance, you know, and she mentioned how the pandemic has a psychological effect or emotional effect. And she also talked about being thankful for family. I think there's a lot of wisdom in what the caller, Ms. Boone, was saying uh, in, in her statement. You know, too much of a bad thing is bad for you. Too much of a good thing is bad for you. You know, so where do you strike that balance? So if you, I've heard individuals, if you go see relatives, just like, you know, our father and mother are, are much are older, they're elderly, and when family members go see them, they come outside, they stand on the porch, they stand at their car, the grandchildren see them and things of that nature. And, and still, you're seeing someone every single day, checking on them, taking the groceries over there. Oh, do you need anything from the store so you don't have to go out? But even to get out to get fresh air, walking up and down the street, walking in, in your yard, Having, having contact with nature. You know, these are all things that help your psyche, right? You know, so there, are, one thing that the pandemic has done, and as African Americans, we know this very well when it comes to trying times, it creates an opportunity to innovate, right? So if you don't have the money, you don't have the resources, but you still got to get it done, you innovate. You get things done, right? Because at the end of the day, you got to get it done. So that's one thing that the pandemic has done. It's given us an opportunity to innovate. How do we now get our message out to the greater public without a lot of us being together at one time, but still connecting, right? So that's what social media comes in. It's been used more effectively, I think. A lot of meaningful things over social media. Um, that's where individuals have been uh, innovative and in spacing. And also, as the caller stated, understanding the value of family. Because a lot of people have been impacted negatively by this COVID-19 virus. It is real. It is serious. So we want to know from you, how have you been affected? Has it been a positive? Has it been a negative? What are your thoughts about the tighter restrictions? Are these things going to impact your job? Has COVID-19 impacted your job? Will it impact your small business? Are you a small business owner or a business owner? How has COVID-19 affected your business? And what is it that you want our elected officials to know and public servants that we need from them to help us? Because as I mentioned before, well, 757 uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 757 757-823-9110. 757-823-9110. Give us a call. Let us know. Because I said before, this is the number one issue that the president-elect is going to have to deal with day one he steps in office. So we talked about the economy. I want to go to that now. I want to segue over to it. When we look at the economy, the, what do these restrictions do? Do they cause individuals to cut staff? cause individuals to cut time for operating. You know, that is a major impact. As they come in, individuals come in for business, come in for services and the like. But again, it's giving companies and businesses a time to innovate. That's going to be our topic in the second hour because I want to really delve into the economy and what we're dealing with right now because a lot of these gifts that's been given to the country and individuals, these moratoriums, they're going to get ready to end very soon. So where does it stand? But going back to the pandemic, the virus itself. Now, we talked about masks, and I talked about how masks are just a regular part of our lives now. I've got my, I got my glasses, I got my wallet, I got my keys, I got my mask, I'm ready to go. And being able to you know, wash your hands and make sure that you're conscious being around people. You know, if I need to get some fresh air, do I go take my mask off around people? No, you go away from where people are. 
you know, doing things inside your car on your own property and the like to get that connection with nature and with family. But there's a vaccine. As a matter of fact, there are several uh, drug makers, big pharma, as we call them, that have shown results, positive results, you know, with the pandemic itself. Um, well, the vaccine for the pandemic. And there are many people saying, you know, we're getting ready for this rollout. And President Trump implemented what's called warp speed. Even though he was talking, you know, out of the side of his mouth against the, <laughs> against the virus itself and the need for a vaccine or need for, for restrictions in mass, his administration implemented Operation Warp Speed in order to get a vaccine out much faster. And to give confidence to the public, you know, Dr. Fauci came in who had worked with uh, HIV AIDS and had seen that from the very beginning. SARS, H1N1. You remember H1N1? That virus that came about during the Obama administration? Ebola and the like. You know how, you know, H1N1 was actually kept at bay on the coast, California, New York, didn't come into the center of the country because we actually had a White House that understood why infectious disease are very dangerous to our country, and our economy, and the people, and set up an office for office of pandemic response. That's leadership. I'm just throwing it out there. But now we have a vaccine. And I remember when people were hesitant about the H1N1 flu vaccine, right? It's like, oh, we're not going to take it. And I remember the, some of the administration lined up and sitting in chairs, and they, that's when they had the nose spray. You could spray the vaccine in your nose to show that it was okay. But we have this movement of no vaccines, or vax, vax movement, where individuals are skeptical about vaccines now and the damage or purported damage that it does. And again, there's you know little evidence about a lot of these things. Of course, all medications have side effects. But there's this internet movement, very similar to other internet movements and, and the like. But individuals saying that they're not going to take the vaccine no matter what. Or they're not going to take it when it first comes out. They're going to wait and see. You know, others see it as just, hey, I want to be first in line to get this vaccine. It's just like any flu vaccine, any other vaccine that you take. So how should we view this? What are your thoughts? 757-823-9110. Are you going to take the vaccine? Do you feel comfortable with our healthcare officials and Big Pharma as they're producing these vaccines? Matter of fact, there was one question that was asked to Dr. Fauci on one of the morning shows this morning about how we should be investing more or just as much effort in educating the public about the safety of vaccines and the safety of this vaccine that's coming out. And he agreed that we should because there's a lot of misinformation or other information about vaccines or the negative side of vaccines. But what are your thoughts? Do you take the flu vaccine, the flu shot? I mean, the flu shot is something that it's just like when you go, go get a checkup at the doctor. Oh, have you had a flu shot? You get the flu shot and you move on. You know, is this going to be just like the flu shot? You know, this is something that we're looking at and a lot of people are talking about because now you have a large amount of Americans who are skeptical about the vaccine. And given the misinformation that has come over through this White House, you know, can you blame them? You know, but again, misinformation and miseducation is the worst type of weapon out there because it's so devastating. That's why the Russians were so important, so, so successful in causing a riff in our election process because they were able to infiltrate the messaging coming to our people. So these are some issues that we have to deal with. But what are your thoughts? We want to hear from you. Keep in mind, on State of the Water, 
this is a show where we discuss these important issues that are important to you. And your voice is just as important, or if not more important, than anyone else's voice on this particular show. We bring these issues directly to you and ensure that you have your say and you're able to share your ideas. So give us a call, 757 823 9110 757-823-9110. And this is a show where we don't record a lot or at, at all. We do this show live. Sometimes we have interviews that we have to catch individuals throughout the week. And, you know, we record those interviews and play them back to you. But we do this show live because we want to hear from you, the listeners, the callers. The most important part of our radio station here at WNSB, 91.1. So we're talking about the pandemic and the economy. In the first half hour, we're, we're dealing primarily with the pandemic. In the second, we're going to deal with the economy. But also, given everything that we're dealing with, this is the Thanksgiving season. 2020 has been quite a toll on the American people and the world itself. But still, we got a lot to be thankful for. So as you call in, we want to know what are you thankful for here in 2020. So as we now look at going from the pandemic to the vaccine, we want to ask ourselves, how is this going to affect us moving forward? You know, is the way we deal with infectious disease is this going to change our lives it's going to change our lives for the better or change our lives for the worse because even with a vaccine we're still going to have to operate in a in a way we're going to have to operate in a way where we're still going to be conscious conscious of our time conscious of how we interact with each other you know so it's a different it's a different way of thinking you know if you think about other novel diseases And I want to bring up Dr. Fauci's work with HIV and AIDS. You know, it's a way that we had to deal with individuals differently. So, you know, we have a caller on the line. Caller, this is State of Water. Caller, if you could turn your radio down behind us just a little bit. Turn turn your radio down. Okay, I've done that. All right, caller, this is State of Water. Give us your name and also where you're calling from. My name is Bentley Montier. I live in Newport News, Virginia. Mr. Montier, tell us what's on your mind. Well, they were talking about the vaccine and <clears throat> excuse me, and whether people should take it or not. Yes, sir. Um, and, and as a black person, um, I would encourage every black person to avoid this vaccine like the plague. And the reason for that is because the United States government has a habit of poisoning and killing um, the, the people of color in this country. We've seen that time and time again. I wouldn't take that vaccine. Not at all. I wouldn't. Well, so, you, well, well, you know, you bring up an important point because African Americans and the healthcare system, you know, we dealt with Tuskegee experiment, the sterilization project down in, in the Delta, Fannie Lou Hamer, one very uh, famous person that was uh, unfortunately uh, went through that, that process unknowingly. Uh, and, and again, we look at the, 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 the lack of health care and proper health care in the African-American community. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people look at the flu shot as being uh, and being vaccinated, getting your shots, quote unquote, your shots when you're going through school and so forth. You know, so d- would you see this as just another type of shot that individuals are getting to help them like the flu shot or your vaccinations when you're going throughout school and going through society? Well, well, I, I've never had the flu, and I've never had the flu shot. So there's a, there's a result there. And my children, they don't take flu shots, and they've never had the flu. Um, there's another thing that's important here, which, you know, people may or may not be interested in it, but, and it is the spiritual point, uh, the spiritual perspective. And that is for those who believe it, um, we don't do sickness because God didn't, he's, he's not given us that. That comes from the enemy. And, and that depends on what a person believes or, or doesn't believe. And I believe that because I'm healed by Christ. I don't suffer sickness, and I don't. And I have met a cold in 30 years at least, at least that. Well, look, thank you so much for calling in. And listen, this is a time to be thankful. So I'm asking every caller, in this Thanksgiving season, give us one thing that you're thankful for. I'm thankful that God is in absolute control and man is not. 
Thank you so much for calling Stay of the Water. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. You know, well, that's why we have this show. You know, we have a litany. You know, the African Americans were not a monolith, right? You know, and that's why we want to hear from you. So what are your thoughts as we go now, we deal with COVID-19 and the pandemic? You know, this is a very trying time. But one thing we do know is that we will get through this. And as we we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in the next half hour, we're going to discuss the economy. This is Stay the Water. Hey, 757, it's Doug Perry from the Blazing Hot Morning Show. Help me cook a turkey. To make a moist turkey, you need to soak it in a brine for 24 hours. And I focus on my side. I just my first year cooking Thanksgiving dinner at my house. Hopefully you're having a wonderful turkey day. Make sure you tune in Monday morning for the Blazing Hot Morning Show. We are a community first station. Blazing Hot 91. This is Stay the Water, and I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Claville. And in the first half hour of our show, we talked about the pandemic and the effect that it's had on our community, tighter restrictions by our governors, and also this is going to be the first major issue that our president is going to have to deal with coming into office. But we also look at the economy. And in the second half hour, we want to talk about the impact of these restrictions upon our economy an area. Is it more important to save lives or save jobs? This is Stay the Water, and this is the pandemic and the economy, and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Stay of the Water, and I'm your host, award-winning Dr. Eric Clavell. And we're talking about the pandemic and the economy. And we have a caller on that's calling in. Caller, you're on the air. This is Stay of the Water. This is Stay of the Water. Caller, go to the next call there. Okay, we're going to get that caller back on the air. But in the first half hour, we were dealing with the pandemic itself and the impact that it's had upon our society. But now we want to look at the impact of the economy, the pandemic on the economy itself. Now, we do know that this pandemic is real. It's taking lives. We see the increase in uh, COVID infections. We're up to 13 million. Unfortunately, we got a quarter million, over a quarter million deaths because of this. But in order to sustain ourselves, we have to ensure that individuals are doing things to protect themselves. So here in Virginia, our governor went from 250 to 25 of individuals coming in. And there are a lot of things that we're currently looking at and asking ourselves, do we need it? So we have a caller. Caller, you're on the air. This is Save the Water. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Good afternoon. This is Martinez Johnson calling from Fort Eustis, Virginia. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. This is Save the Water. Tell us what's on your mind. God bless you. First, I'm coming from the perspective of a Christian, uh, and, and, you know, we follow the name of Jesus. And I want us to all be concerned because we live in a time that is pretty much has always forced us to be... Uh, pretty much be subjective to what the government puts out. I have a government job, and even if I don't want to take the vaccine, some of us have jobs that mandate us to take the vaccine. As a matter of fact, when we sign us our children up for school, one of the things that they ask for is, has your child been uh, vaccinated, or has your child received a vaccine, the flu shot, hepatitis, hep A, hep B? And these are things that if they don't have, they are not allowed to enroll. And I wonder if any of the listeners out there have any type of situation that is similar to that. Your job mandates it. I know my wife works in the healthcare health care field, and she has to take the flu shot. And I just wonder if this vaccine for the coronavirus is going to be mandated. They haven't put it out yet. But uh, if we, I don't agree with it, but sometimes our jobs make us get it. 
You know what, Carla, you bring up a very important point because that was one of the discussions on the morning shows all this morning and some of the articles that I'm reading as it relates to who's going to get it first, right? So there's going to be a rollout, a rollout of this vaccine, just like it was a rollout of H1N1. And and if you work a government job or you're employed by the government in one uh, faction or the other, you understand or you remember H1N1 under President Obama and how people were skeptical about it. And they had to put on television. They showed a lot of the upper cabinet members taken in. And that was the time where you had the flu miss, right? So they actually kind of shot it up your nose, you know, to show, oh, it's okay, it's okay. So, you know, with that, do you think that that will give the public more confidence if they show the top executive officers and agencies of our country and even on the state level taking this vaccine and saying it's okay? I do that. I, I do believe that it give them more confidence. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yes, well, listen, thank you so much for calling. And listen, before you leave, this is the, the season to be thankful. So I'm asking every caller that calls in, give us one thing that you're thankful for here in 2020. I'm thankful for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, saving me and my family for keeping us um, away and, and safe from the coronavirus. I'm thankful to have a family. I'm thankful for shelter. I'm thankful for just life and, and life more abundantly. Caller, thank you so much for calling State of the Water. We appreciate your support. Uh, God bless you. God bless. Well, you know, the caller brings up a very important point. You know, he talks about you not even being able to go to school without having your vaccination shots. And, of course, like I said, there are movements on the coast and other areas of the country where they, kids don't get, don't get these vaccinations. But scientists argue that because of the vaccines, We've been able to eradicate things like polio. We've been able to eradicate even all, almost the measles, right? These are, these are diseases that took out hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of people or main millions of people. But because of science, because of medicine, because of the innovation of these vaccinations, we were able to eradicate it. Now, we don't have to worry about polio. We have to worry about, almost almost have to worry about the measles. But some argue that because of this misinformation, that now there's a possibility of resurgence of these dangerous diseases. So there's argument both ways. You know, but here, one thing that we deal with on State of the Water, we also like to deal with the facts and the evidence. So we want to hear from you, the caller, 757-823-9110. You know, what are your thoughts as we go from the pandemic and we now look at the economy? How has COVID-19 affected you and your family? How has it affected your job? Are you a business owner, a small business owner? Has COVID-19, has the economy affected you negatively or has it affected you positively? Because some people have prospered during this time of the pandemic. 757-823-9110. So let's take a look at the economy. Some argue that these tighter restrictions are going to cause companies and businesses that were barely making it to falter. Let's take a look at the restaurant industry and bars. You know, before, you know, COVID-19, you know, restaurants and bars were, were making their due and, and the like going through, going through the cycle, right? You know, of course, we live in an area heavily populated by universities. Universities are economic drivers, Because every year you get tens of thousands of students flocking to our area that then spend money, that patronize businesses and the like. And they patronize it for two years, four years or more. And it becomes a part of their lifestyle. And they remember it. I I remember uh, hosting some guests here uh, uh, not too long ago. And we went over to a certain, certain eatery and they remember 25 years ago, oh, we see here all the time. You know, so it was a place that was familiar to them. You know, but because of the shutting down of universities, some going virtual, all virtual, some being hybrid, and then the shutting down of these restaurants, they saw a major impact to their businesses. And then the implementation of masks, 
you know, how do you go? You got to come in with a mask, but then you can take it off and eat and then put it back on after you finish chewing. And then when you start, when you take a sip of your drink, you take it down, but then put it back up. Some people say, hey, I'll just take my food and go home. Or I won't eat, go out and eat at all. It just becomes too complicated, right? <laughs> but, you know, this is what we have to do in order to survive and to make it. You know, so in understanding that, these are things we have to do to save lives, but it's going to impact the economy and impact your business. As a business owner, you have to ask yourself, what's more important? Now, of course, we've had a stimulus in the very beginning, but unfortunately, we have issues currently with a stimulus not being passed. So there are some issues there. Right now, we got Nancy Pelosi who's the leader of the House, Speaker of the House, and Mitch McConnell, who is, of course, the majority leader of the Senate, they're at odds on how big the next stimulus should be. Mitch McConnell says we want $500 billion, half a trillion dollars, because we're concerned about the deficit. Now, let me digress for a second. Now, here's a group who were known to be fiscal conservatives only when Democrats were in office, but when Republicans were in office, they spend... Like, it's going out of style. But more specifically, they give tax cuts to the top 1%, 2 and 3% of the country. They spend on other things that don't really benefit Main Street. But when it comes time for entitlement programs, social programs, and programs to help Main Street and give individuals a hand up as opposed to a hand down, now they want to be deficit hawks. Well, I think, <laughs> I don't think that's going to fly, Right. You know, but what are your thoughts? You know, is this something that they can refocus back on now that they've given a tax cut to the top three percent? That's going to give us a one point two trillion dollar deficit every year. You know, I don't know how many people understand, but after the tax cut that the top three percent received in the first 18 months of President Trump's administration, the general uh, the governmental accountability office came out. With the report, it's going to, we borrow now. We borrow, we borrow before the pandemic $100 billion per month in order to make up the amount that we're losing from taxing the top one, two, and 3% on capital gains and other taxes. We borrow $100 billion every month. This was before the pandemic. But nobody said anything about the deficit, right? And again, this was this was all a Republican led because they had control of this going through. So that's something that I want us to understand here on State of the Water, that we have to look at the fine print. We got to look at what's being said, but also more importantly, what's not being said. And look at the government reports that are not not partisan, but it just gives you the numbers, because one thing about it, numbers don't lie. So, going back to the stimulus, we have a stimulus bill that we had $2.2 trillion, $2.2 trillion that was drafted almost overnight. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but the time period to draft a, a document, a, a bill, to get that type of money to every organ and every person in the country, it took a very short time. Many of us receive a stimulus of $1,200 per person. I think $600 for if you have a child up to a certain amount of children that you have. And that money, we showed, the evidence showed that a lot of people use those to pay bills, to get caught up, you know, on their bills, to pay their rent and the like. And it got a lot of people out of the red and into the black. The moratorium on paying your mortgage and rents and things of that nature. Um, The moratoriums that were placed on student loans. If you have federal student loans, it's been about six months since you've had to make a payment on it. And the percentage down to zero. Now, I've always had an issue with the government charging interest on a student loan to get education. If anything, there should be no interest charged on those things, but it's still... Uh, a loan and should possibly turn into a grant if you know you make payments within ten years or fifteen years, you know on time payments. 
And that's something that they tried to roll out in the Obama administration, but it came so cumbersome. It, 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 it really became so hard to do that many people still to this day, 99 percent were rejected. And even under the, uh, 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 the Trump administration, you have individuals, universities that took advantage of people, unfortunately. And their loans were supposed to be forgiven because those universities for profit, a lot of them folded. But they challenged the forgiveness of those loans. So when we start to talk about the stimulus and helping policy, fiscal policy, helping people, students have been left out across the board. And there is an issue now where we talk about $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. $1.7 trillion, that's how much individuals who went to college to be productive in, in society, add to the knowledge pool in society, are strapped with these types of loans because the economy started folding, contracting, couldn't find jobs in those areas. So some say, well, you took the loan out, you owe it. But others see where there is a contract with society. If I go to the university to get this education in this field, but then there's no job waiting for me, then was I misled? You know, where do we meet in the middle? And now we have a situation where society now is contracting even more. The economy itself is contracting more. So what do we do with these individuals that have these student loans? Well, some say $10,000 across the board. Forgive $10,000. If we forgive $50,000 across the board, that will eliminate student loans for 75%, two-thirds of, just about two-thirds of all student loan holders. That would be life-changing. But as African-Americans, we're there's a disproportionate amount of loans that individuals take out as African-Americans because their families historically don't have as much money to support students. And a lot of times, you know, students are still working. Those loans are just to pay the tuition for school. So there's an equity issue when it comes to loan forgiveness. And also African-Americans are not as likely to be favored in the job hiring process. So we're dealing with that as well, right? So there's always a racial component to it, an equity component. When we talk about America, when we talk about the economy, when we talk about jobs, when we talk about who gets what. So we have to factor that in as well. So we're going to see what happens, but there's going to have to be some type of student loan reckoning. Student loan forgiveness, it's got to happen. It's got to take place. If not, then you're going to see a generation that's going to be worse off than their parents, even though they may be more educated on paper than their parents. We'll deal with that in another show. <laughs> but I want to get back to the economy itself. So with the stimulus, the moratoriums are going to end in December. The So in there, we may have individuals before or after Christmas or at the beginning of the new year that may be evicted from their homes because there's an end to the moratorium. We may have individuals in December, right before Christmas, after Christmas, or right in the new year, whose electricity, whose water, whose sewage, those things, whose gas may be cut off in the winter months. And... It can get cold here in Hampton Roads and in certain parts of Virginia. But when we start talking about the Midwest, we start talking about the Northeast, it gets pretty cold in those areas. If you've been to Chicago in the wintertime, you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to go back. You know, so how are we now going to deal with these individuals that really need the help? You know, these are some major issues that we have to deal with. And the number one issue not just the pandemic, but number two of the economy, which are connected, that we're going to have to deal with when President-elect Biden comes into office. But did the stimulus help you? You know, as a small business, did you benefit from the stimulus package that was passed? Or did you not benefit and the, the pandemic affected you, t affected you negatively? What is your story? 
888-900-9110. We're talking about the impact of the, the pandemic on the economy. In the first half hour, we talked about the pandemic itself, how COVID-19 has affected you, and the vaccine. What are your thoughts? Will you be taking it? And now we're looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, especially here in Hampton Roads. Did you lose your job due to pandemic? Are you at risk of losing your job after the last stimulus ends, which is going to be again next month? Are you a small business? Has it affected you negatively? What has been the effect to your bottom line? What's been the effect to the lenders, you and your, the lending company? What's been the effect on you and your staff? What are your thoughts moving into 2021? Will you be able to survive? And what is it that we want our elected officials to know that we need to help us? I want to get back to this, this stimulus bill where we are now. Now, you know, we're here and as I stated before, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, the minority leader in the Senate, or the Democratic leader in the Senate, they're in polar opposites of Mitch McConnell and what they really want to deal with as it relates to this stimulus package. And the president said he's going to throw his hands up. He's out of it. You know, the election is over. It didn't work out the way that he wanted to work out. So he said, I'm going to let them handle it. I'm going to let them take care of it. But who's suffering from it? You know, it's the people. It's Main Street that's suffering. You know, are you, well, most people, a lot of people that have lost their jobs are just one stimulus away from floating and going through the Christmas months into the new year without worry. They're one stimulus away from it. And being able to search and give them at least 60 to 90 days, 90 days to start looking for more employment, to start looking for jobs that's going to help them make those ends meet. You know, but we could, we could see the impact of the economy itself just with individuals in food lines. You know, we have the president and CEO of uh, Feeding America, Claire Babineau Fundno, who is also alum of, we're both alums of the same law school. You know, they're seeing the increase and in the flood of people coming to areas just to get food, going to shelters just to get a meal. You know, you know they're seeing the, the major hurt that individuals are having just to fill the void, you know, to bolster their, their cabinets at home. You know, you have individuals that are standing in food lines, even when it's raining, just get a couple of bags to tie them over because they're single parents, because they've lost their jobs, or even they still have their jobs, but their hours have been cut, or they're working minimum wage. And they're trying to just get a little bit to help them tie them over at the end of the month. And food insecurity is, food security, well, it's really insecurity, is a major issue. Because we're just not talking to an individual. You know, when you're trying to feed yourself, you know, you can feed yourself. But when you have children who are trying to grow, children who are trying to get the nutrients they need to help the development of, of their brain, help the development of their bodies to ensure they don't get too much sugar and more vegetables and more fresh fruit and things of that nature than, you know, processed foods and carbs and which will help to cut down on cardiovascular disease and diabetes and high cholesterol. And as we call it sugar, you know, these are all things that have a effect that rolls downhill food insecurity. But this has been the impact of COVID-19 in the economy. While you have individuals who were separated around the corner from each other in their offices, if you've ever been to the Capitol and been around, you know, that side of the building or you've been over to the, you know, Senate office buildings, you know, their offices are not too far from each other. We, you, know, you know, it's literally around the corner here, around the corner there, 
uh, or one floor separated individuals. So, you know, you have these issues where you have individuals that won't come talk to each other. They're down the hall. But we have people who are real, people who are in our communities, maybe even your neighbor, maybe even you. Maybe you're listening to State of the Water right now and you're in that situation. That you're one stimulus payment away from either going into the new year with no headaches or fewer headaches or not knowing how you're going to make it going, leaving out of this year. So we need a stimulus bill that's passed. We need a stimulus bill that's really going to help the people of our community. We need a stimulus bill that's going to answer the needs of people in our communities. That's going to answer the needs of small businesses because I got a feeling that we're going to, if we don't get this stimulus, if we don't get any relief, I got a feeling that we're going to have a lot of businesses boarding up. We're going to have a lot of people that say, you know what, I can't make it. You got a lot of people that's kind of tapped out on their credit and said, I have no room, zero room. I can't make it. So to avoid that, we're going to need our elected official to step up to the plate. But that's going to involve us. It's going to involve us making sure that we communicate that to the greater, to the, to, for the greater people. And it's just not doing the election time, Right. It's just not being able to go to the polls during election time, pushing a button and saying everything's fine. But continue to call. Continue to call your elected official's office. Continue to write letters. You know, send emails. They'll listen. They have staff that all they do is answer constituent messages and calls. When I was uh, working for an elected official as a, as a teen, young person in college, that, that was my job. At first, answer constituent calls. That was the number one issue that my boss advised me. Make sure every constituent call is answered, you know, either with a letter, call them back, see what the problem is, direct them to the public service that can help them, and then follow up with it. And I remember that. And that's really what helped me to really understand the needs of the people in the community as it relates to being a public servant, an elected official. And that's what we are. When you're elected official, you're a public servant. And here on State of Water, being able to communicate information that is timely, that is evidence-based, that's focused, that's right, that is the public service that I give to the Hampton Roads community and the greater community that's listening to WNSB. So hopefully, what we're saying will help you to think about these important issues that are affecting you. Because at the end of the day, whether it be today, whether it be tomorrow, we're going to have to deal with the pandemic. We're going to have to deal with the economy itself. But as we deal with it, we're going to ask ourselves, how much smarter have we been in dealing with these issues, these adversities that come our way? As African Americans and strong people that we are, we've faced a lot of adversity. You know, whether it be in our personal lives, in our history, whether it be on the job, whatever the case may be. But we've been stronger for it. We've been better for it. And we've come out on the top. You know, and we're going to be able to do that with this. So I want to encourage all of us to understand. You know, we've had a lot of people call in, talk about their faith in God. And as African-Americans, we have strong faith, strong faith in God, strong faith in our faith. And we know that a lot of times that's the only thing that we've had to hold on to. So keep in mind, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through it. But we have to be smart as we do this. And as I end, I say that this is our Thanksgiving show as well. It's a lot of things that we have to be thankful for in 2020. And what am I thankful for? I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful for my family. And I'm thankful for you, the WNSB family that listens to Stay in the Water. Your support for Norfolk State University. And all that we do means everything to us. And without you, we could not be here. So join us again every Sunday at 1 o'clock here on 91.1 Blazing Hot WNSB. And you can look at us online as we bring you Stay of the Water, as we talk about important issues that are important to you and others here on the air. 
And until then, we'll see you next Sunday. We are your blazing hot music spot. Let's get it. WNSB, Norfolk, Chesapeake.